Good morning, Austin. We are calling to order meeting 273 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, June 27, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We'll begin with item number two. Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, you have uh, the minutes from the May 29th, 2019 meeting. I would move their approval, again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, please. Uh, oops, sorry. No, June 6th. Yep. Uh, next, Madam Chair, you have in your packet the minutes from the June 6, 2019 meeting. I would, again, move their approval also, again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any non-material matters. Uh, uh, yes, Second. I have one comment just mm -hmm. to um, accord the same formality to mm -hmm. my fellow commissioner just on the front page. Um, Enrique will Zuniga. make it Commissioner yeah. Zuniga, please. Right. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it consistent. But you okay. don't need a last name for it to be memorable. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, wow. So all those, if there's no further comments, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, please, Catherine. Okay. Moving on to our administrative update. Director Bertrosian, please. Good morning, commissioners and chair. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Under item A, I, I have two issues. The first is um, that this weekend is a historic weekend. It is the last final racing at Suffolk Downs. Um, if you know the history of Suffolk Downs, um, what, it, what um, the attendance was in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, and saw some of the pictures of what went on there. Um, I'm sure for a lot of people, this will be a emotional weekend. Um, for us, we'll, uh, our folks uh, under Director Lightbound will be there out there doing what they do all the time is their best job uh, mm -hmm. regulating the racing. Um, but uh, as I said, this will, I'm sure, be a historic weekend for, for many folks. So. Um, I'm going to yeah. go out on Saturday and watch the races and Good. see what everyone's doing. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second item is maybe, and this is before we get to item B, which is the uh, Encore Boston Harbor Operations Certificate vote, but the second item, just to tell you the obvious, which is um, we have opened Encore Boston Harbor. And from my perspective, um, I'd like to thank a bunch of our staff. And it really falls into what I uh, call three buckets. Um, first, there are the staff, the gaming agents, the technology folks, um, our central monitoring folks, the gaming core of our staff who was there testing machines, um, our financial investigators who stood in the cage during practice nights to make sure the cage staff worked well. Um, you know, our gaming agents were in surveillance, making sure surveillance people were up to snuff. Uh, they were monitoring slot machines, table games, um, everything. Um, and we were so fortunate to have people working literally day and night, 24-7, really working hard. Um, so I'd like to thank them. The second bucket, um, Joe and John, um, making sure that license commitments were met before, up to, and even after. That will be an ongoing, uh, ongoing process, and that is thousands of commitments, documenting them, making sure um, there's substantial completion. If not, the commission's aware of it um, and the reasons why. Um, so that was no small task, th and thank you to them. Um, the third bucket, and maybe the most important bucket, is all those folks who weren't involved in those first two groups who stayed behind to make sure everything else we do kept going, mm -hmm. um, that we were able to walk and chew gum at the same time whether it's our executive assistants, our HR folks. Um, we are very fortunate to have uh, all our team members, you know, rowing in the same direction and supporting those of us who are out at the property, technology, 
um, you know, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, and I apologize for that, but we were very fortunate. So I would like to say thank you. Um, I think it was a very successful opening. We had, we were very fortunate um, to have good communications um, through the property and public safety agencies about uh, how people could get to the property. Um, that particular day, the 23rd, um, it was um, very successful. I think people took a lot of public transportation alternatives. I happened to drive in very early. It was as smooth as I've ever driven to that property. Um, so it was very fortunate. Um, so that's from my perspective. I'd love to turn it over just briefly before we get the operation certificate to Bob DeSalvio, <coughs> president of Encore Boston Harbor, to hear his thoughts on opening. Thanks, Ed. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm joined here today by Peter Campo, um, our Director of Construction, and Jackie Crum, who is our Senior Vice President and General Counsel. And um, I'd like to do a couple thank yous as well. First and foremost to Peter to, for building one of the most awesome buildings I've ever been affiliated with. The construction work is terrific. They got it all done on time. Uh, and um, it, we're really pleased to have just the men and women of the trades did a beautiful job along with Suffolk and Peter and the WDD team really uh, A plus on that building. It's fabulous. Um, I'd like to thank Jackie for um, going through all of the gyrations leading up to the opening. There was um, commitments galore and um, a lot of preparation on that. So thank you, Jackie, for all of that. Um, and I'd like to most importantly thank the over 5,000 team members that we have at Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, they did an amazing job handling that. Um, it was quite a crowd. I guess I should throw in a thank you to Mother Nature for cooperating on one of the most beautiful days. I, I remember I did not look at the weather app for the two weeks prior. I know you guys know the story. I was afraid of jinxing it. Um, but on that morning when I clicked, I finally clicked it when I saw it was sunny and it said 34% humidity and I said, wow, we haven't seen that in greater Boston in 25 years. Um, <laughs> and so it was really a great day. Um, I think the strategy worked well. Uh, we wanted to do it Sunday morning. Uh, I think that was the right call. The line started early, but you know, relatively few people. And then it started to really build by about seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Um, I will tell you, we had at noon about 5,000 people in line out on the Harbor Walk. Thank, thank goodness we have that Harbor Walk and all that open space because it really came in handy. Um, and we were able to queue folks and not have them anywhere near the roads. Um, the general public, I would like to thank the general public for cooperating as far as the um, transportation alternatives. And we're hoping that um, they will keep that going. I found one interesting tidbit that was an um, online survey that the Herald did. And the question was, um, how are you getting to Encore Boston Harbor? And I'd like to read you the results. This was just from an online survey they did. 33% um, said drive. 14% said cab or ride share, 24% said public transportation, and 29% said water. Mm -hmm. Now that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. That is a very, and again, it was just a sample that I was, you know, when I couldn't sleep one night and I'm reading random things online, um, I pulled that up. But it was interesting because people really did take advantage of the options. We, have a, we had over 1,000 people come by water on the first day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people are really loving the, uh, the Premium Harbor uh, water shuttles. And um, we're just going to continue to promote and ask people to um, think differently about transportation. But uh, big kudo to the, kudos to the general public for actually trying some new ways to get there. And actually, this whole week, it's been um, uh, relatively good so far, you know, into the whatever it is, four days in operation. Um, so again, so far, so good. Um, the team was amazing. And it was really a great, um, great opening period. I'd like to add that I tested you on your assessment. I think Commissioner Zuniga did too on the assessment of the walk from Sullivan Square. Ah. I thought you, your 10 minutes might be overly optimistic. And I would say it was very accurate. Mm -hmm. And it was on that day a gorgeous walk. Do you agree? I did, absolutely. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think we all tested different modes of transportation. We all uh, took um, 
uh, public transportation. I came back. I, I went to the property um, via the Orange Line and walked from Sullivan Square, but then came back via the employee shuttle mm -hmm. um, to, Mal uh, to uh, Wellington Center when I came back home. And uh, there's, there's something that I just want to mention for uh, 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 you know, this picture that I have in my mind. As I'm waiting for the employee uh, shuttle, that's where you, the, the, the employees park all their bikes. Mm -hmm. And there was a remarkable amount of bikes. Bicycles. Uh, it was almost full. All the bike racks that, that you have were, were full. So it's clear this, this, mo this notion of um, multimodal is also uh, permeating not just to the general public, but uh, as, as evidence here to the commissioners and other commission staff, but notably also to employees, which I think is, uh, is, is, is also worthy of mentioning. Well, and I'm glad your numbers checked out, or I guess I would have been hearing from the IEB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know a couple of us uh, took uh, the, the water shuttle, which was an excellent way to travel, um, and, and I'm glad so many of uh, your patrons uh, enjoyed that way also. I would also just like to thank, um, I think the coordination between both teams was excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've seen that over the months, but it was uh, in crunch time, it was particularly important, and I think um, we all got to see that firsthand, so I would like to commend both teams for, for that work. And our team, um, just really strong work, and I, I just love the coordination. To me, that's so important to, um, to, to, to have anything like this, any kind of a, a mission, to, to have it be done well, you need to coordinate. and. Um, the coordination with our gaming agents, with our uh, gaming enforcement unit, uh, to see Everett PD and the state police working shoulder to shoulder, the force multiplier because they work really well with security, um, you know, constant meetings. Uh, you know, I walk around and an hour later I'd see another little impromptu meeting talking about an issue. Um, so I think everyone um, on all of the teams, I saw Game Sense working hard out there at the at the opening, our Game Sense advisor. So I think everyone really, Joe, I know how much you were into all of the commitments, you and John. I mean, it just, it just, it was apparent the work that was done, and I'm just, I'm really proud of our team, and I just want to thank you. And I have one more thank you to uh, Commissioner O'Brien for yes. having the meeting yes. on Thursday night into Friday morning at 1230 yeah. Uh, in the morning, um, and this way we didn't have to pace all day waiting to see whether we were going to get an operations certificate. So thank you for um, ending that process early. Oh, we appreciate fine. it. <laughs> then I could go home and sleep a little. It was about 12.30, 1 o'clock, I think, by the time. 1 o'clock in the morning. So you, you, mm -hmm. you were more efficient because when we did Penn, we did it at 4 a.m. Well, three nights this time around, which yeah. I think probably speaks to the licensee and the, the process of three nights. Yeah getting it right by the time you got to night three, so. Good work. Thank you, Commissioner, yeah. for representing all of us out at the, uh, out in the field. No, it was, I, I joked with people that I feel like I, you know, kind of jumped in and sprinted the last, you know, couple hundred yards of a marathon. Mm. Um, I'm later to the game than a lot of the people at the commission and, and the licensee and, and newer to the industry. And I have to say that um, it's been said before, and I will just repeat that um, I appreciated the work that everyone did, particularly for our team, I don't, I did not fully appreciate the details and the depth of the commitment until I was out there last week and, and understanding what goes in with IEB, with the gaming agents, Game Sense, the Section 61 commitments, the level of detail that goes into all of that. Um, the eye for detail in terms of everything that we looked at when we were over there, from the cage to the tables to, you know, everything that was going on, security, et cetera, and then the the congeniality, the cooperation um, in terms of sitting down, you know, after each test day or test night in terms of what they notice, the different observations, and then um, moving forward, you, sit, you saw marked improvement every night. So that by the time you got to night three, that was an option. We didn't know if it would be or wouldn't be. But, um, and um, maybe Bruce says this to, to everybody, but, you know, number 18 was his favorite, according to the conversations we had. What? So you might want to take that up with Bruce later, but. I thought 17 <laughs> was your favorite. I think I said that to you, too. Bruce. You did? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that 18 the number 18. of casinos you've opened, uh, Bruce? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, if I can just men mention uh, something here, there was never really a, a, a master strategy in the order that we opened these casinos here, needless to say. They, they happen organically and for all these reasons. But uh, 
having the largest and perhaps in some ways more challenging um, um, casino, if you will, open uh, last, really um, provided a great, you know, uh, way for us to get up to speed, you know, before before that. I think by the time we're doing this third one, there's a lot of things that we learned along the way. Um, you know, you mentioned Penn earlier. Um, you know, that that was a very different time frame uh, in terms of opening and and, 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 and and whatnot. But we got through it. Our team is clearly uh, a lot more, um, you know, uh, sensitive to what these are things that we need to focus on, uh, and uh, and just the size of this operation uh, presented as a, ch a challenge in and of itself. But I think it went very smoothly, thank, thank to all the work that we've been done before as well. Yeah, and I, I think all three licensees, frankly, mm -hmm. took took their responsibility seriously, understood what we were trying to do, and um, partnered very very well. So I think we're very fortunate. Yep. Uh, with our three licensees. Mm -hmm. I think we have Mr. Mathis in the room, and so we're giving him a thanks for helping <laughs> give, bring us uh, mm -hmm. along the way. I wasn't here for your opening, but I know that lessons were learned from um, for you because of your leadership, and I know Bob appreciates that as well. <clears throat> so um, that, uh, with the caveat, uh, Commissioner Cameron, thank you. I did, in fact, forget someone, which is the GEU, so I would like to mention the collaboration between state and ever police and then the ever police and state police on the outside all the details um, public safety is always paramount important um, and so mm -hmm. the work that the men and women uh, of those agencies did um, is not to be forgotten or underscored either so thank you for reminding me of that um, my last thank you was as i think um, bob had pointed out to commissioner o'brien um, thank you for coming um, i hope you did learn something from the process about uh, what happens in staff and i do agree with uh, what everyone else said the muscle memory of opening two category one casinos in the same year um, definitely helped no question about it the process at mgm uh, paved the road for a lot of what we did and if there were things we needed to perfect we had the benefit of doing that in this process so um, that was very helpful. Um, but so I'm done with my general update, and then I would um, turn it over to Commissioner O'Brien to describe the process of how we got to the conditional operations certificate and then move on to the permanent operations certificate. Certainly. I, I think I covered some of it in my thanks. So I, I'm not going to keep everyone here longer than they need to be on the topic. But um, we did. I, I attended the three test nights, the 17th. Um, the 19th and the 20th and, and really shadowed, you know, either Director Wells or Bruce and Burke from um, Bruce Bannon and, and Burke Kane and or the gaming agents in terms of going around, seeing the cage, seeing them, you know, put people through the paces, walking me through what all the mechanisms were, making note of things that needed to be fixed, either a long-term problem uh, issue or something that had to be done immediately, um, running lists excuse me, running list in terms of what was going to be needed on a temporary certificate versus what could be given a little bit more time. Uh, and that went to security, to the games, to the cage, to everything. Um, and then I did have the opportunity to see, you know, the game sense people and, and our sort of front and back of house people as well. Um, again, the meetings were efficient, um, either our, I'll call them post-mortems, after each test night and then sitting down with the people from Encore in terms of what needed to be done. Um, so that by the time we got to Thursday night, it was, um, I, again, markedly improved from, you know, the postmortem report that I had gotten on the first day. Um, and so when we got to that night in terms of that mid-evening and then late evening in terms of the temporary conditions, um, there were, a, the only thing I think that was slightly different from MGM is because of the timing of things, there were a lot more Section 61s um, that needed to be specified and sort of laid out. Um, and we can get to that in terms of what's going to be in the permanent um, operation certificate. But there were some issues that were mostly um, Director Band pointed out in terms of things that needed to either immediate fix or a very short turnaround time that were put into the temporary certificate. But nothing either that was brought up by anyone from IEB or um, Director Band that spoke to anything that questioned sort of the integrity of the games or the safety of the patrons or the operations. Nothing anywhere um, in that category. So um, I did not have any hesitations in signing the temporary certificate that night. I know that there's some updates to be had in terms of some of the temporary 
requirements have been met. There are some that need a little bit more time that we'll have to attach to the one that we're going to vote on today. Um, and then we can go into some of the Section 61s that I know they've even been able to knock some off the list in the, in the week or so since we've been there. But um, based on what I observed that week, um, and then as we sit here today, um, going over what the recommendations are on the conditions that would attach to the permanent operation certificate that I would recommend um, that we move forward as it's laid out in the packet in, in executing the final operation certificate with the recommendation on the conditions. So and I don't know, um, usually what we've done in the past, I think, is just uh, check in with uh, our gaming folks and see how we're doing in the four days. Last four days. Button, but button. It's been nothing but busy and, uh, you know, positive things on the horizon. So things are operating well. That's a brief update. <laughs> Director <laughs> Band, you're usually... I could make um, up better stories, but... I, yeah. No, we don't want you to make anything I'm up. I'm afraid Bob will <laughs> kick me if I do. <laughs> so it's running smoothly. Yeah, things, what things are running me. well in there, and the counts are going well. Uh, Great. Uh, all the teams seem to be working very efficiently. And uh, When you mentioned the counts, we didn't mention finance, uh, finance because they were out there, too, yes. watching both the, what was happening in the cage as well as, you know, er everything else that we do out there with the finances. So uh, kudos to, to your team as well. Do you have anything to add to that, Mark? Well, we look at uh, all the different departments. We've been watching them the last three or four days. There's some general things that could uh, be expected with the opening, but it's nothing uh, monumental that isn't going to be ironed out through learning the processes better. So it's gonna be I agree with Bruce that everything's good. Great. Thank you. Okay. So are we going to go through some of those... Um, Conditions uh, on the memo, or anybody? Uh, I'm just in terms of process. So the process, um, the vote that would be before us, because yep. we right now have the certificate. So I agree, um, Commissioner Zuniga. If we could um, understand, is this the time now to vote, or do we wait for? Um, should we wait for Mr. Ziemba's, uh no, I think, I think we could vote. If you have any questions about the conditions, I think these are the conditions on that are being recommended as a result of the process. On the second page yes, of our memo. exactly, mm -hmm. right. exactly. Do you want to walk us through those? Um, um, okay, thank you. I think it's included in the packet. Um, Commissioner, is your... Oh. The memo, the recommended conditions are included in the packet, but to, to lay it out more formally, um, this is shorter than what with the temporary ones because, again, they've knocked some off the list. But the recommendations are um, to continue. One of the conditions that was temporary that we're recommending continue until it's rectified um, is um, just adding additional cameras on the ballroom area um, and making sure they're operational in terms of alcohol service. Um, that was an area where it's just a question of wiring and again, getting things going that's going to take some time. Most of these, I think we're doing, um, is it 90 days, unless um, otherwise specified yep. in terms of whether we think they either have to be or can be executed more quickly. Um, the other conditions that are being proposed are um, that the licensee provide to the commission any further documentation needed to confirm compliance um, with the commitments that were described in the commitment closeout update that was presented on June 12th of this year or that was in the packet. Um, second, that the licensee shall install panic alarms inside the main bank and in each high limit parlor lounge. That was within 30 days as opposed to the 90. Uh, the gaming licensee shall ensure all receiving panic alarms have installed speakers. That's also a 30 day rather than 90. Uh, the gaming licensee shall install additional cameras in all service bars or temporary bars to ensure that all full coverage is achieved. That speaks to what I talked about the first time, which is just making sure they can make maximum use of the space, but also, you know, do what we think needs to be done in terms of um, protecting clientele and safety. Um, they shall um, angle all frontline cage facial shots 10 degrees down. That was uh, Director Brand's recommendation in terms of just making sure you have the full camera angle that he felt was necessary. Um, that the gaming licensee shall ensure the stadium gaming roulette wheel located in the R zone. The dealing shoes and the other gaming equipment has the ability to be securely locked. Now, I may 
if you want further detail on this, it was explained to me, but I don't think I could do it justice. <laughs> I think Director Band or, um, or uh, Burke could explain in greater detail what this means. Uh, that that is essentially we require all gaming shoes and roulette wheels to be locked up when they're not in use or they can't be tampered with. Uh, this is part of the stadium gaming, so it's a little mm -hmm. different than normal. So we just have to get uh, some pieces made for they can secure those if those games are, are not operating. Um, and additionally, that the gaming licensee shall display additional non-gold fair deal signage in the following back of house areas, the commission's office, the first and second floor back of house, the parking elevator banks, and the parking elevator lobbies. Correct. Uh, and I believe that color choice was to make sure it stood out from maybe any other signage that was around. Yes. And lastly, that the casino credit department shall be either relocated or sealed off from the cashier's cage, and I understand that would be a 90-day. That's going to take probably a little bit longer to actually make that happen. But it's nothing that jeopardizes it, anything in terms of the integrity of the count room or the cage. I, I had a quick question about the um, additional cameras on temporary bars. I mean, there's a, these are pop-up bars. You move them around depending on you know the events and activities and, and where your business is. Yes. Uh, how do they try to? meet that obligation to have camera activity where these things M most pop of them, up because these most of the bars are on the casino floor mm -hmm. right. it's not an issue with adding cameras or everything they okay. will have standard places that they will uh, put these okay I think they're still trying to feel their way as to how many of these pop-up bars they they need so we just want to make sure that when they do arrive we have proper camera coverage okay. and so just for point of clarification on that the last test night they ha they had the need to do this and they position the pop-up bars in such a way that they were covered so okay. they have been this, this was in discussion last week too and sort of they knew where to place the bars appropriately okay and, and this extends beyond the gaming floor to banquet convention space down that end of the property as well. yes yes mm -hmm. earlier conditions any other questions i i have one question if, with respect <coughs> to the panic alarms uh, those panic alarms that um Folks have, uh, I know we, I think they might have been for hotel employees. Or, am I understanding correctly? And yeah. if so, these, what are the These speakers? panic alarms are actually in each pit area and everything. Oh, so they, if something occurred, that, you know, it draws attention and that I don't have to go over and pick up a phone and it'd be real obvious to whoever is causing the disturbance that I'm contacting authorities. So there's an associated yes. speaker. Okay. Those we typically the put those in pit stands. I um, see. I so understand. That, uh, yeah. That's help, really helpful. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, uh, so um, so it's fair to say that uh, perhaps with the exception of the casino credit relocation that you just explained, Commissioner, that all the other uh, conditions uh, are um, straightforward in terms of meeting the time frames? Yes, we work closely with your team, and I think we can accomplish any, everything within the 90 days other than potentially the last condition. Right. Which requires some structural changes? That's correct. Any further questions, comments? Um, again, thank you to our team and to your team, Mr. DeSalvio, for a, a very, um, it, was, it was just a simply great celebration. And so we appreciate all the efforts that, you know, I, and like Commissioner O'Brien said, I'm a very late arrival here. And um, <clears throat> it was a, a very joyful event, so thank you. Um, the only thing that I would share with everyone that for those of us that were there in the wee hours Friday night coming back down um, to leave, there were a number of Encore employees who were wrapping up their shift, sort of hovering in the hallway. And we ended up coming through. It was essentially a gauntlet. Yeah. Um, the very enthusiastic employees. And I thought you guys were going to take a turn, but then I saw you come back. Um, and I was also struck at that moment, too, by the enthusiasm of all the people that were working there basically cheering and high-fiving. Um, they had no idea exactly what had happened upstairs. They were just happy to see everybody walking through the hallway. So They, they were absolutely thrilled, and uh, it's a wonderful team. They've done a great job, so thank you for that. So the only other issue I would note before you vote is you'll see there's a separate memorandum uh, in the packet, and that describes the Section 61 right. commitments mm -hmm. that we need to monitor. Those are separate license conditions. So we just wanted to be clear. You'll be voting on 
the permanent operation certificate with the attached conditions that you just described, but the Section 61 commitments are something we will monitor separately, and, and um, we, that memo outlines that process. So, and as Commissioner O'Brien said, this uh, process was a little unique as compared to MGM. We had a longer maybe runway where we dealt with some of those issues um, beforehand, but we are not, we are aware of them and we are going to monitor them as outlined in the memo. Mr. Delaney. Uh, Mr. Delaney, do you have, do you have something to add or are there anything, I, I mean, I read the memo, but are, is there anything there that concerns you or do you feel like everything is on track um, to meet those obligations? Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> when we issued the conditional operation certificate, we knew that there were these several items that were still outstanding. Obviously, we didn't think they rose to a, a level that would prevent the conditional operation certificate from being issued, um, and, and we don't feel that way at this point. Um, you know, in the, in the intervening week, a lot of these things have, have been addressed already. Um, you know, on, the, on paving, that's happening today. Uh, the payments that went to MassDOT and to the city of Everett have happened. Um, and then there are a few items that are going to take a little bit more time. The purchase of green power is going to take maybe 30 or 60 days. Uh, we're saying 90 just as a, as a good round number, but we think that's going to happen sooner than that. Um, then there's a whole bunch of things with MassPort, MassDOT, MBTA. They have to close out permits and do uh, as-built drawings, and, and there's still a little bit of work to be done. I think there's a gate over at the MBTA. So again, we're giving sort of a 90-day period to say, you know, we think that's that's sufficient to get those items closed out. Um, and then there's the um, the issues with the surrounding community agreements. We've now gotten copies. We've gotten letters from all of the communities except for Melrose on that, and we reviewed Melrose's conditions. They were a neighboring community, so there really were very few uh, conditions on that. There were no payments to the community, and, and so on. So we think that. Uh, those few items that are left out there uh, with the 90 days, we should, should be sufficient to close those out and we'll keep monitoring them and we'll report back, uh, you know, within 90 days or sooner if they're closed out before that. Joe, uh, just a quick note on the surrounding communities and neighboring community agreements and getting letters kind of for this point in time, general acknowledgement that they're in compliance. That is a piece of ongoing review because there are annual commitments that are part part of this as well. Absolutely, we're we're working now on you know developing that ongoing uh, operations list of items. You know there are annual payments that need to be made. In fact, all the first payments to the surrounding communities go out within 90 days of opening. So we'll be tracking that, right. and then the annual payments thereafter. And then there's a lot of other conditions that are that are, uh, you know, outreach to the communities, to the Chambers of Commerce and other things, and we're going to keep track of all of those things. As well. Okay. So it's, not, it's a snapshot here, but it's an ongoing piece. Correct. While some of those others get wrapped up. Okay. Any further comment, uh, Commissioner O'Brien? No. no. Do we have a motion? So, Madam Chair, I move that... Um, Pursuant to 205 CMR 151.013, that Windmass LLC on Core Boston Harbor is in material compliance with all of the prerequisites for the issuance of a permanent operation certificate subject to any conditions determined by the Commission to be included in the permanent operation certificate, um, and that the Commission issue a permanent operation certificate subject to any conditions included by the Commission. I think I said that twice to Win Mass LLC on Core Boston Harbor. I further move that the issuance of the permanent operation certificate is subject to Win Mass LLC on Core Boston Harbor's continued compliance with all of its projected uh, commitments and conditions that are part of its application, license, and permits, and that such permanent operation certificate is subject to compliance with the conditions and agreements previously imposed by the Commission on Win Mass LLC on Core Boston Harbor. Is there a second? Second. Any further questions? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you, Catherine. Good job.
nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Now, moving on to Region C, um, Commissioners and Chair, um, as you know, uh, the Commission denied a Region C application formally by way of written decision dated August 11, 2016. At that time, the applicant did not appeal the Commission's denial in court. However, in 2018, the applicant did send to the Commission a motion for reconsideration. The Commission did authorize the legal department to send a responsive letter to that motion in September of 2018. The Commission and staff have always monitored Region C developments, including Mashpee Wampanoag litigation about its land and trust status and developments in neighboring gaming markets. Uh, later in 2018, the Commission authorized staff to put out for public comment a series of 14 questions related to Region C issues. That comment period ended November 30th, 2018. In January of 2019, the Commission stated it would be appropriate to reconsider these issues when the Commission had a new chair. We have a new chair. And Chair, you had asked me specifically to put this item on the agenda and summarize where we are. That, what I just did, I think, is a brief summary of where we are. Thank you, uh, Director Bertrosian. Yes, as you referenced, um, we have on our desks a petition dated February 5th now, um, 2019, submitted by the law firm Goodwin Proctor on behalf of its client, Massachusetts Gaming and, and, and Entertainment, to reconsider its application for a license to develop a casino in Brockton, in <coughs> Region C. And as you stated, the original application, although we weren't here, was not approved by the Commission in 2015. Uh, I appreciate the petitioner's patience as we attended to other matters. Since my arrival, I have you know, let uh, Director Bajosian know that I have not wanted these issues concerning Region C to get lost in the shuffle. So we appreciate uh, the petitioner's patience. Um, as you noted, Director Bajosian, I felt it must be a priority for us today to begin the process of being briefed and updated on the status of all matters relating to Regency. Given that neither Commissioner O'Brien nor I have been involved in any past discussions and decisions relating to this region, I think it makes uh, sense as a first immediate step for the legal team to <clears throat> bring us and the rest of the Commission up to speed by first providing us with a legal analysis regarding the status of the motion for reconsideration. Precisely, I'm interested in learning whether the Commission has discretion to move ahead on it or whether all administrative remedies have been exhausted, um, <clears throat> requiring instead a timely appeal under what I understand would be Chapter 249, the CERT. Um, there may be other issues to consider, of course. These were just uh, two that came to my mind, but I think that legal analysis would be very helpful for a first step. I would invite uh, Goodman Proctor, uh, Mass Gaming and Entertainment's Council to present on that threshold issue, um, that very threshold question as to the propriety of that motion in being in front of us at this time. Um, and they could present perhaps at the same commission meeting that the legal team briefs us and we can coordinate that, I suspect, in the future. I think it also, as you referenced, it makes sense for us to be briefed on the public comments and responses to the questions that the Commission um, issued last year. I, they were tabled in January, so that briefing, I presume, would inc include the response or responses offered um, by MG&E in its brief that's on our desks. And finally, I think um, I agree that it's very important for us to receive an update on the status of the Mashpee Wampanoag um, litigation and related legislation and legal matters. They're complex, um, and I think they've been changing over time, so it probably makes sense mm -hmm. you know, for those of you who are better briefed to get that update as well. So if my fellow commissioners ag agree with this approach, um, then uh, you know, I, I welcome, obviously, if you have other uh, ideas. This would just be a 
sort of first steps in getting us up to speed on this matter. I don't know if you agree, um, love your comments, and then if you have any other issues that you think are related to Regency that we should address. Yeah. No, I, I certainly agree the steps are appropriate. Um, we haven't uh, had a briefing in a while on this topic, and I think, um, as we know, uh, status has changed. Uh, uh, casinos in Rhode Island have changed. There are, there are new uh, data points that we have not had an, uh, a chance to take a look at. Certainly a full briefing by our two newer commissioners is appropriate, so I certainly think that um, uh, that strategy makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, obviously, you know, there are, you know, some other um, tidbits or stories that we're hearing that are out there, potential changes to the gaming statute included. Um, but I would just like to suggest that, you know, the, the list of questions that we had up for comment Obviously, anybody at any time can weigh in on the mass comments line to offer their opinions, and you know we should kind of maybe not have them address those same questions. But obviously, folks from the public, you know, I would assume uh, interested parties down in the southeast region or anywhere else should always feel the opportunity to weigh in where appropriate. Uh, you know, I um, I I, I think. Uh, you know, for the for the most part, I think it's important to get that refresher that we all seem to be, uh, um, you know, on board of of, of getting. Uh, my recollection, uh, though, is that we at least, or at least, you know, the, the the petitioner had put forward their rationale for the motion for reconsideration in the first or second time around, um, and you had at least you, we had put out those. <coughs> Questions for public comment, and you know, there's there's no limit in terms of time frame when people can can continue to uh, to provide comment. But um, that it would be um, good for all of us, uh, uh, the public especially, to get an up to you know get a, get a refresh of, of all of that. The most uh, salient points of of, of that uh, either the threshold, the legal question. Uh, et cetera, and I think that's that's very important. Uh, I take it it's not something we will do today necessarily, but something that we could schedule for a future meeting, if I'm reading, um, you know, uh, correctly. Um, and and um, and I think that would be very helpful. Um, I see a second matter that you started to allude to, uh, Commissioner, which is something that I've been um, uh, wondering about, and that is the need potentially or possibility of us doing um, or commissioning a market assessment, an updated market assessment, which also you, you started to mention, uh, Commissioner, relative to um, my, uh, my, my good recollection of all of the projections from applicants, um, uh, either from, the, from, the, from, from all the regions, um, was that they were slightly higher than what we are seeing uh, come in, but you know some of those projections are beginning to level off and et cetera, et cetera. But what they all projected was that with the introduction of additional casinos, namely the category category ones in Massachusetts, there will be a dip of revenues for the existing uh, slots parlor, in this case uh, PPC, uh, et cetera. So um, I think. We, and, and we need to think about the time for doing this because, um, of course, the, 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 the Anchor is just a few days into its operations. Uh, and even MGM um, is about to complete one year of operations. And I'm not sure that counts as a leveling off of, 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 um, of the projections. But I, I want us to start thinking also about the possibility of doing a market assessment refresh. Um, in which we can then uh, also ascertain how the market has changed from the first time that we looked at the um, at the Regency um, uh, license license decision back in 2016. So uh, just 
Commissioner Stebbins to pick up on something you said uh, about public comment. Um, I would note um, that Senator Brady is here today, uh, the senator whose jurisdiction includes the um, area of the initial application. Um, I briefly talked to him, and he would like to make some public comments. In the past, we have often um, offered public officials the opportunity, um, even at this introductory stage, mm -hmm. to, to make some comments. If, but this is within the discretion of the commission. I think it's appropriate, and we have done it before. Senator Brady, welcome. I think the last time we saw you was at probably the hearing on sports betting. Yes. And so thank you, um, and we welcome you today. I just wanted one clarification before your remarks would be on the, um, the legal memo. Commissioner Zuniga is quite, quite right. There, was, there were some arguments presented in, in the petition or the motion for consideration on our desks. I think that probably we would expect that it would be there would be additional depth to the legal analysis to be really helpful for us to understand whether or not that we can act on it. So sure. uh, that's what at least I'm seeking, and unless I hear an objection to that, that's why we wouldn't really wouldn't be able to comment today. It does require additional work, uh, Council. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to welcome you to, to the new chairmanship of the Gaming Commission uh, and welcome Commissioner O'Brien and good to see the other commissioners who are still on board here. Um, as I mentioned in the past in some of my correspondence and letters, I am in strong support of the Regency uh, Third Casino being approved at some point. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the city of Brockton. I went to the public schools in the city of Brockton. I went on to Massachusetts Community College, which is located in Brockton. Then went on to uh, get into the insurance business, and I uh, worked for Metropolitan Life, then owned and operated an insurance company in Brockton. This is uh, before I decided to have the crazy notion of, to run for public office, which takes half of your time. So I served on the school committee of the city council for 14 years in the city of Brockton in this district where the proposed casino is. Then when uh, the state house seat opened up, I, I ran and was successful in 2008, uh, serving as the House of Representative, um, representative from the district. And then when we lost a good friend, Tommy Kennedy, who grew up just a stone's throw from this casino, and I, I also lived within a stone's throw of the casino. Um, we, I had won a special election a couple terms back, and I'm continuing to serve uh, as the state senator from the district which encompasses the second Plymouth Bristol District, which includes the town of Easton, which abuts, abuts Brockton, and then it goes all the way to Hanover down to Plimpton. And I also worked for the state lottery in between that time, too, so I'm well uh, educated in the gaming business and so forth. And uh, when I got elected to the state house, I had taken a leave of absence from the state lottery at, at the time, and I'm continuing to just do my job as a state senator now. Um, so being that being said, we did have a vote of the residents a while back, and there was overwhelming support from the residents in the city of Brockton to support this third Regency casino. I had talked to a lot of our elected officials. I know our mayor has been in strong support of this casino. Our, most of our elected officials have been in support of the third Regency casino. And, I've, and I want to do congratulate before I go on Springfield. I had the opportunity to visit Springfield. They have done a tremendous job in the neighborhood where the casino has been built. I looked at the businesses around the casino. They've made improvements in the businesses, the facades, the revenue, and the jobs that have been allocated to the city of Springfield. And then I also, we, we um, as one of our colleagues, we've been doing Commonwealth Conversation tours visiting different Senate districts. We were down in Brockton last year on the same thing. So we checked a business that was a couple blocks away that we had lunch on, and we asked them, did it affect your business either way in a positive or a negative thing? Because, you know, a casino's in there, they're going to offer food, et cetera. They said it hasn't affected him at all. He had had a gold mine business to begin with, serving great food, and he's continued to do well. But the business in the close proximity within the, the block around the casino had made tremendous investments in, in their businesses, new facades, new infrastructure, and it actually cleaned up some of the places that may serve alcohol it cleaned up some of the unwanted activities. So that was pleasantly surprised. And I've talked to my constituents that I represent in Brockton and East and the surrounding towns. 
as I mentioned, there's overwhelming support. Now, this location is proposed at the Brockton Fairgrounds, which is still in ex existence. It is only open for approximately two weeks during the summertime. It's going to open up in a, a week or so through the uh, 4th of July holiday. At one point in, in you know, those questions about what well, can Brockton handle the, the amount of traffic and so forth, this is probably less than a mile from the Route 24 highway. There's two ma major thoroughfares, Route 123 and Route 27, that come right through um, this area, right off the highway. And at one point when the fair was up and running many years ago when fairs did more business than they do now, we had over 100,000 people coming to the city of Brockton. And as far as entertainment, we even had Diana Ross and the Supremes perform there in the 60s. So this area has a rich history of entertaining. And we have a Brockton Rocks baseball stadium that was built uh, a couple years ago. It was a semi-pro team. They were hoping if the casino went through, we even had a chance to get the Pawtucket Red Sox. We met with the owners of the Pawtucket Red Sox to maybe put that, that team in Brockton if the casino was approved. Unfortunately, the casino did not get approved, and they went to Worcester. And God bless our friends in Worcester. I have a lot of friends in Worcester. My mother was born in 1924 in Worcester, and she moved to Dorchester and then to Brockton and, and so forth. But I have a lot of friends and I'm very supportive of, the, of our friends in the Worcester community. But that would have been a great addition if this casino has approved. It was other businesses also that were looking to come to Brockton because the casino was proposed in Brockton, looking forward to the casino. And, you know, Brockton was born and built in the shoe industry, of course. We can't live in our past laws. That's of yesteryear. There's a few small shoe industry businesses, but like Footjoy, for instance, made the world famous golf shoe. And with the changes in the industry and things being less expensive in other countries and other states, the shoe industry isn't what it used to be. So the medical industry is the largest employer in Brockton in the private sector. And that's close proximity to the highways and so forth. And then also we have W.B. Mason's headquarters, which is a world famous office supply company. Their home headquarters is located in Brockton, in the downtown, which is approximately just about a mile and a half from this proposed casino. So all the businesses that I've spoken to, the restaurants in close proximity, they have all been in support of this. And, and I'll tell you, just from seeing what happened in Springfield, it's helped out the area. And I want to congratulate our friends in Everett, too. As Commissioner O'Brien mentioned, that shuttle, the transportation by the ocean side, has been a, nothing but a great benefit to the Everett Casino. So I thank you for those comments. Um, but again, we're, we're right a stone's throw from the highway. We also have a commuter rail that goes through Brockton. And there's three railroad grade stops in Brockton. In, Thank God to our forefathers were in that in, in vision. There is no railroad grade crossing in the city of Brockton. Only place in the country that has this. You either have the viaducts where the traffic can go underneath, or you have the bridges that go over. So it helps with traffic flow going east to west. The only place in the country that still has this existing. And you hear some of the other proposals where the train is proposed. They're worried about traffic and the traffic signals and so forth. So our forefathers had great vision. So. Getting back to my support, you know, Brockton has, is greatly depending on state funding. Our school system does fantastic. They, I graduated in 1980. They're doing a lot better than I went to school. And our, our band with Vinnie Macrina wins awards all over the country. These are uh, um, advanced students who get accepted to the top schools in the country, Harvard, Boston University, Yale, you name it. And they are doing fantastic. But without the funding from the state and the local funding, they would not survive. So the revenue that's desperately needed for Brockton, the jobs that are desperately needed because, as I mentioned, the shoe industry isn't what it used to be. The medical industry is doing well, but this would be an added boom to our area for the jobs, the revenue, and also the infrastructure because we got some state funding to pave 123 this past year, and they're still in, in um, time to reconstruct it. But the gaming commission, the company proposing to come in was going to help with some of the infrastructure which would have helped alleviate the cost of the city of Brockton, help alleviate the cost of the state, and then we could have used that revenue for other roads because, uh, as we know, we're dealing with transportation issues now on the state level, and there's a whole situation we're dealing with that. We are desperately in need of transportation funding as well. This would have helped ease the burden on the state and the Commonwealth. So I just want to reiterate, I've, as you know, I've written many letters in support. I am at your disposal if you ever want to meet in Brockton. As I mentioned, I grew up in this neighborhood. I'm happy to take you around at the commission. I know some of you have already been there, but if you want to come back and visit and so forth, and any questions that I can be of help with or any history. Sometimes I, I'm like an old man 
uh, telling the history of Brockton, but I, uh, I'm very passionate about Brockton. That's why I ran for office. And I've had tremendous support from my constituents in support of this casino, so uh, this third proposed regency. So any help I can be, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm going to leave my cards if you want to contact my office as well. But I want to reiterate my strong support from, for this proposed regency casino. And I uh, ask the board to uh, continue, as you mentioned, there was a reconsideration proposed. And I'd uh, ask if you uh, keep your open mind moving this regency. And I still, there was a question, too, about well, is there too many casinos being built, et cetera? But, you know, I visited Springfield. That was great. I haven't been up to Everett. I'm, I'm working with my colleague in the Senate to hopefully visit the new Encore Casino. But in the South region, I still hear from people that are going to other states. They have the so-called golf and gamble trips where they rent a bus, they go down and, and uh, play golf, and then they have a nice lunch afterwards, and they visit the casinos in the other states. And we're losing the Massachusetts residents continuously to these other states. And we have some great golf courses in there. Thorny Lee is a world famous private course, but also some public courses within a stone's throw from this casino. So it's a perfect opportunity to bring good entertainment in Brockton. And we've even had some other bands. I, I know Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan had performed at this Rock Stadium, which is again across the street from this proposed casino. So we have the potential to bring more good entertainment into the area. So I thank you for your time. I know it's a long day for you. And I know you've had an arduous uh, journey, and I welcome you again as the new uh, chairperson of the commission. And any help I can be, please don't hesitate to contact me. Well, I thank you for the welcome, and I also thank you for the history, because as I stated, it is new to me. And as I stated to Director Bedrosian, it was very important that um, we have this topic you know, come up onto the agenda appropriately. And so, again, I thank everyone from Regency for their patience on this matter. So thank you, thank and thank you. you again. And one last thing, I, we, we were also known as the City of Champions due to our sports history, and Rocky Marciano, who grew up only a couple blocks away, is still the only undefeated world boxing champion in the history of boxing. And thank God, when Mayor Menino was the mayor of Boston several years ago, they were thinking of putting the statue in Boston. He said, Rocky grew up in Brockton, mm -hmm. should go into Brockton. And we have a gigantic rocky statue that tourists visit right on the grounds of the high school, which is at the Marciano Stadium, again, close proximity to the proposed casino. So it's a great tourist destination as well that people visit that and some of the museums in Brockton. So thank you again for your time. Thank you, thank sir. You. Any questions from anybody? Thank you. Oh, thank you. We thank appreciate you. it. And I'll leave my cards. I know some of you know how to get a hold of me already, but I'll leave my business cards here. Excellent. I can be of any help with any future thing. And again, if you do want to come and visit, I'm happy to take you for a tour. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. <coughs> Commissioners, that's the end of my administrative update. Thank you. Thank you, Director Petrosian. We move to item four, and Ombudsman Ziamba and Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager, items four A and B. And we welcome um, Mr. Mathis from MGM today. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Up for consideration today are two requested deadline extensions related to the MGM Springfield project. Uh, up first for consideration is an extension of the deadline for the installation of a photovoltaic system on the top level of the MGM Springfield garage. The original deadline for the installation of the system pursuant to our Section 61 regulations is one year from opening. MGM Springfield recently reported that it is moving forward with this, this installation and that the PV system was important to MGM Springfield achieving LEED Platinum status for the facility. Uh, MGM Springfield has requested an extension to December 31st, 2019, but expects to complete the work uh, earlier. Uh, we recommend that the Commission approve this extension. Any questions? It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the schedule for the installation of the solar power system at MGM Springfield as more fully described in the Commission packet and discussed today, specifically extending the deadline to December 31st, 2019. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. 
Commissioners, on April 12, 2018, the Commission approved the detailed construction schedule for the MGM Springfield project. The completion of the development of the so-called Dave's Furniture site was due to be completed by July 8, 2019, under that schedule. Uh, close to the opening of MGM Springfield, it was announced that Wahlburgers is planned for that site. MGM Springfield previously reported that it was taking uh, some time to finalize the lease for this development. Um, that lease has uh, since been executed. MGM Springfield further requested an extension uh, to July 8, 2020, but has expressed a desire to work to an earlier completion. Uh, MGM Springfield will provide a construction schedule to Commission staff when it becomes available. And given all of this, we recommend that the Commission approve the extension. Um, John, just a quick question. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. Is the, the Dave's Furniture site within the footprint of the uh, gaming establishment? It is. Okay. So, um, just more of a quite more of a, a topic that we can follow up on. But um, considering MGM's successful track record with your diversity during the construction phase, I'm assuming, or is there an interest in carrying over that success and diversity on the construction to this part of the project? Uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, before I answer that question, if I could just take the opportunity to congratulate the the win team and commission and commission staff on um, on a great opening. We welcome them to the Commonwealth. Um, we more than anybody know the the euphoria and exhaustion that comes from that undertaking, and um, and by all reports, it's been very successful. So congratulations, and I'm excited to uh, to compete with them. Um, to, to answer your question on the um, on some of our HCA and, and other sort of corporate initiatives as uh, as relates to tenants, um, we do two things. One is we we have conversations with the tenants themselves as part of the selection process, is to make sure that they share some of our our same um, sort of um, core you know initiatives and beliefs. Um, in this case, they certainly do. I think that um, they operate in um, very diverse locations, so that may have been less an issue. Um, but also we have, we have lease language that, um, that encourages them to um, maintain diversity. I think we come short of requiring it because that's difficult given, um, given different hiring practices and, and not knowing their oper operations. But we have had that conversation and we'll continue to, uh, to monitor it. We're also going to help them with um, their, uh, as we have with other tenants, uh, Regal, Cinemas included. We're going to be helpful for, with them on their workforce development. Um, we have the same, we, we know the channels and we know the different workforce partners. And by that very nature, I think we can help drive some of the diversity that we all would like to see in our facility. So um, I hope that's satisfactory, but it's something that we have talked to them about and that we're, we're focused on. Okay. Any further questions? Do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the Commission approve the construction schedule for Wahlburgers at MGM Springfield as more fully described in the Commission packet and discussed today uh, with specific focus on the reflection of a new deadline of July 8, 2020. Second. Any questions or clarifications? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioners. Uh, before I close, I, I want to report that I continue to have good conversations uh, with principals involved in the potential 31 Elm Street development, uh, which is the residential requirement for MGM Springfield. Uh, while there's certainly no announcement today, I do believe that we can have a more substantive um, update uh, by MGM Springfield at the next quarterly report, which will likely be in August. And just to, uh, Mike, I had the opportunity to be out in Springfield, uh, just to give MGM a good shout out uh, on Wednesday night, had a chance to, to kind of walk through the plaza. Nice night, people out there enjoying the Red Sox game on the big jumbotron, sitting around the fire pits. I mean, it, it, it still is kind of, it, it definitely is still a kind of community engagement location. So continued congratulations to you and your team on a good operation. And President Mathis, I know this isn't your quarterly update and you're not prepared to um, fully brief us, but um, 
just while we have you here, and as you know, we've been um, we've been uh, paying a lot of attention to our newest licensee, but we always are very interested in, in what's happening at Springfield because that's a tremendous project. Um, do you just have anything that may have happened during the last couple of months um, to, to just let us know about so we don't have to wait till August? Um, <laughs> I was prepared for someone to call an audible, so. Um, <laughs> but uh, ab absolutely. Um, one, I, I think just, just to go back to, uh, you know, I, I marvel at how uh, how your staff is able to juggle all the different balls that you're able to juggle. Um, we thought with the win opening, we would um, we would we would get a little call it reprieve from Bruce and Burke, for example, um, <laughs> that they at least would be distracted, but they continue to be vigilant and fastidious, and um, it really is a, it's a testament to how hard uh, your teams work. So. Um, I can say from operationally, we didn't skip a beat in terms of our relationship with your staff and keeping, keeping the trains on the track, notwithstanding the, the big undertaking of this opening. Um, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of the operation, uh, it, it's gone extremely well. I think as Commissioner Stebbins um, you know, mentioned, I think our, our property really shines um, during the, the spring and summer months into the fall. And because of how important that outdoor engagement is, and that's something that um, we, we certainly want to tackle in the winter where there were um, very successful but not quite the same opportunities to activate that outdoor. So uh, we've, we've launched our MGM Live concert series. Mm -hmm. um, basically, every, every weekend of the spring and summer, we have a, a, f a free show on Friday out in the plaza and then a paid show on Saturday. That's a bit of the formula. And it's been really successful. We brought new customers to the property. Those customers have spent time in the resort as well as out in the plaza. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of diversity of acts. We've had, um, uh, we've had rock bands, classic rock bands. Uh, we had Hanson, the, the, the mm -hmm. boy band. Mm -hmm. um, we got completely overrun with Hanson fans. Um, they're an aggressive, um, um, very passionate group of, of mainly women. Young, uh, young girls? <laughs> unfortunately, um, with respect to me, young young girls, yeah. but I think in their early 30s. They um, probably don't qualify as the boy band uh, that's right. anymore. I think. That's right. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a little older, but they still, uh, they still marshal a lot of uh, enthusiastic fans. So it's been a lot of fun. We opened up the Plaza Bar. Uh, which has been really successful and well received. We used to have portable bars, and now we've got a, a, a great plaza bar. Uh, we've tented the the uh, the truss system that now houses the um, you know the entertainment with a stage. And we've had a couple of days of light rain where I was it was actually fortunate to see it because now we're getting a little bit of an ROI on that on that um, canvas tent, and uh, the entertainment um, uh, went off without a hitch. So a lot of activation, as you know, in the um, we can, we've, uh, we've taken over management of Symphony Hall, um, which is a city-owned um, venue, beautiful 2,500-seat uh, venue that, as, as you may know, um, hosts the, uh, uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame annual uh, enshrinement ceremony. So we've, uh, we've started to work on programming entertainment in that facility. Uh, uh, Steve Martin, Martin Short uh, are, are one of the acts coming. We've got comedians coming as well. So I think entertainment, uh, which is certainly um, something that uh, we pride ourselves on, is, is a big focus because I think it, it brings new customers to the city, and that's really critical for uh, us to help develop the rest of downtown as well as to um, hit some of our numbers. So. Um, continue to update you, but we'll be able to show you um, some photos and, and, and um, different statistics from at our next quarterly update about how successful that entertainment's been. Great. Sounds exciting. Thank you. Thanks for Thank the you. question. Thank you again for the tour that you gave me. I had the um, pleasure of, of seeing the entire facility when we were out there for our meeting, and I'm glad to hear that the canvas tent, which is, I don't know if you've all seen it, but it's very, very beautiful. That's sighted right across in the plaza bar that it really is working for you when I I looked I didn't I didn't realize that it's going to be permanent for you but it it's absolutely beautiful and mm -hmm. it again keeps your outdoor space uh, in full use and that's a really um, wonderful addition to a casino facility to really engage your patrons with the outdoors so and I was just struck by again the theaters that's available the bowling alley and uh, and even the golf, um, 
that's available. So golf inside virtual. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, thank you again for that tour. And we look forward to the August report. I didn't hear anything about an August um, entertainment, but maybe you want to wait till to mention a late August. Uh, Oh, sorry. I, I know we're public with it. We have four Aerosmith shows um, and uh, in the third week of August, and the Saturday night show is on our anniversary, August 24th. So uh, we expect a really big August five weekends. Uh, it, it's, it's, it should be one of our should be one of our best months, months if not the best month. So we're gearing up for all the activation that comes with that. Okay. That's great. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Anything further for Ombudsman Ziemba or Mr. That, Mathis? That concludes my report. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and safe you. travels back. Then we're moving now to item five. Uh, Director Jill Griffin, please. Oh, and Crystal Howe. Good morning. Good morning, Chairwoman, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're here um, to discuss the 2018 Community Mitigation Fund Workforce Development um, Grant Amendment a request from Holyoke Community College for the Springfield Public Schools. And I'm going to actually introduce Crystal Howard um, and turn it right over to her. Um, Crystal is the program manager for workforce supplier and diversity development and she's been managing this um, grant amendment process. And she Morning, has her voice unlike you, Jill, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to help relieve Jill's yes. voice for and, a while. And, and Jill, I did bring in a little bit of that honey that I mentioned yesterday, so don't let me forget to I'll give it to you. I'll take you up so. on that. <laughs> So as um, Director Griffin was saying, we have received an amendment request from Holyoke Community College, which is in regards to the Pu Springfield Public Schools budget under the 2018 Community Mitigation Fund. Their specific request is for commission's approval to appropriate $10,000, which had previously not been programmed, to fund the Achieve 3000 platform that they're using in inside the Ahead of the Game program. Uh, you might recall last June, so maybe a year ago, voting to support the Community Mitigation Fund Committee's recommendation that $10,000 of the Ahead of the Game program do not go to, toward the development of the Springfield Works Assessment Tool, um, as it, was, it wasn't directly tied to the casino project. Since that vote, the $10,000 remains unallocated. And it was recommended but not mandated by the commission that perhaps the funding go towards scholarships. You'll see in the packet that they provided some justification for why they aren't doing that. But as the scholarship funding is traditionally through the gaming school and not through the Ahead of the Game program, Springfield Public Schools is encouraging that the commission approve the use of the funds for this Achieve 3000 platform which really is a tool used by every student in the program for English literacy gains at their own pace. Um, to give an idea of that usage, uh, as of last semester, they had 86 high set students and 75 ESL students, all of who were using the program. Um, and you've, you've all been provided with their additional justification bulleted out. So I'd also like to note that the $10,000 request it's not the total cost per year for the platform. The um, school district does provide in their general fund the additional um, funding for the entire use of the platform. So they're just requesting that this $10,000 be allocated to cover that. That's really have, the summary. Do you have any questions? Do you have a sense of what the overall budget is? I mean, we're a piece of it. They said that um, this was under half of it. So I mean, that's really all I know. They didn't give the full platform cost, but for what they, I think the school system uses it in a full capacity too. Okay. So they pay for more than their share. But um, since the school is, it's, this program uses this for every single student, they're trying to pull their part in, especially since they're not doing the scholarships. I think. So you're recommending this now because you really do think there is a nexus. 
it, all of the students use this program successfully? Yes, they all do use it. And of the 86, I did find out this morning that 44 students have currently passed the high set exam. Mm -hmm. And there are an additional uh, 35 who are set to take it in the next few weeks. And this helps them to show where they are and whether they are actually prepared to take those high sets because they're able to do it outside of the classroom in their own space and see how they're actually achieving their goals. So they can push off taking the exam a little bit based on how they're doing in this platform to make sure that they do have the opportunity to pass it. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think this is a modest request and I'll go along with it. I'm just curious if um, the fact that it goes to the Springfield Public Schools, if this is targeting or getting to uh, students that are young or minors, I'm curious as to whether, you know, uh, so Springfield Public Schools runs the adult education oh, program. Yep. So these are all adults. Okay. And um, they focus on um, English language learners and people who are pursuing their high school equivalency or high set. Thank you. I, I certainly think this is a good use of the money. I think that those skills are necessary in order to then um, uh, be competitive with some of the training for the casino jobs. Not only the casino jobs, but the jobs being made available by, you know, folks getting recruited to work for MGM, creating back right. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it builds the pipeline. Yeah. yeah. Certainly. Any further questions, comments? No? Well, I think it's an excellent proposal. Uh, do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move the commission approve the amendment to the Holyoke Community College Mitigation Fund grant as requested by Holyoke Community College and described in the commission back. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Griffin, and, and feel better. I'll give you that honey. And <laughs> thank you, Crystal. Excuse me. Moving on to item six, we have uh, Chief Finance and Accounting Officer Lennon, and we have um, Agnes. Um, Excuse me. Bolier. And, Bolier. and you know, and I know because we've had the, okay. we've had our connection, <laughs> we've had our family connections. We, right and I just couldn't get it out, but we've had our family connections. So thank you. And, and Doug. And Doug um, O'Donnell. Okay. Thank you so much. My apologies, and I know that Janice had uh, the details for me. So, and and I will comment on names later when we have our ice cream socials. So, <laughs> the need for continued assistance on names. So, thank you so much. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Chair and Derek. Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. And just so you don't feel bad, I mispronounced Agnes' name for two years, mm -hmm. and she worked right next to me. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, we have very similar roots, and so I actually love the, the, the French Canadian name, and so thank you so much. Um, just, just one quick thing before I get into the FY20 um, budget discussion. I just want to thank um, all the commissioners and the staff for the work and the time spent on the opening, um, especially Doug, uh, Sarah, and Noel, who were on the floor Tuesday morning at 3.30 a.m. Thursday morning and Friday morning at 3.30 a.m. They didn't get to see any of the fun stuff, the, pre, the play nights, or um, they were there just watching the drop, the count, and the revenue reconciliation process. So um, I do want to thank them for all the time they spent um, and, you know, the dedication to get up and stay in La Quinta those three nights, which was a trip I, in and I, of itself. I, I thought the reconciliation was the fun part, but... It is. <laughs> it is. I know for us. For us. Spoken like a finance <laughs> person. Yeah. He knows how to have a good time. Yeah. There weren't many other people out there with us. At, at 3.30 30 a.m. it's even more fun. more fun. hands being pulled. Right. And, uh, but, you know, I just wanted to. Yeah, no, out. it's, uh, it should not go unsaid that uh, when you're there at 3.30 and you're the last person waiting for that reconciliation, 
it's it's really above and beyond the call of duty and, and it's that's when it started well. it didn't oh, end until the did next morning at like 11 or 12. oh they started pulling the cans at 3 30 a.m and dropping the oh, thanks for that dropping the table yeah. yeah oh gee mm. wow hmm. yeah we appreciate it it <laughs> is uh, critical to the opening it's, and you're more than welcome to join us one of these days when we're out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I did have the opportunity with Director Lennon a few years ago to uh, be part of that process, but we won't, we won't talk a lot about that. Because we won't bring that up with no, we jumpsuits or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, though. Um, we were here three weeks ago uh, to present our initial budget recommendations, and we put that budget out for public comment for two weeks and we received no comments. Um, that's not a surprise based on everything else that's happening around here. Um, but I will give a brief summary of the presentation three weeks ago, um, just so that you remember what you're looking at, because um, we are asking a vote um, on this budget. Staff presented a $43.5 million in spending recommendations composed of the following, 34.2 million in the gaming control fund, of which 28.4 million is for regulatory costs and 5.78 million is for statutorily required costs. 6.5 million in research and responsible gaming funding, which for the first time, and I wanna emphasize this again, for the first time will be funded wholly from the Public Health Trust Fund. Um, and then there was 2.75 million in racing costs. In aggregate, this funds 107 FTEs and six con contract positions. Uh, the combined funding for the Research and Responsible Gaming and Control Fund, which remember we pulled those together in the memo just to compare year over year, um, represents a 7.6% increase from the FY19 funding level. The regulatory portion of those costs grew by 5%, which were mainly due to annualization of costs at the Encore Boston Harbor. And the statutory portion of those costs grew by 14.12%, which also were driven by um, the annualization of um, Game Sense at Encore Boston Harbor, as well as the Public Health Trust Fund, picking up indirect costs for the first time for the responsible gaming budget. There were a few funding exposures in the FY20 budget proposal, which we addressed at the prior meeting. But in summary, um, I'll tell you they were mainly the litigation costs. We're only carrying the bare minimum that our insurance carrier requires. And then there's the <coughs> There's a full year of revenue estimated in the racing side for Suffolk Downs simulcasting, but that money becomes questionable January 1st, 2020, um, based on there might be a need for a legislative fix for them to be allowed to <coughs> continue simulcasting. Derek, on that note, um, so what are you assuming in the, this year's budget in terms of simulcasting revenue for the next six months? Anything? We're Safe. assuming the yes yeah, steady amount, steady. same as amount. Okay. So we would lose, I think, Doug. It's about three quarters of a million dollars. If yeah, it's probably closer to a million dollars, with the um, with the revenue that we receive from Suffolk Downs and the ADWs that they have. Right. Should they not simulcast next Six calendar months, year? Yes. Right. Right. It's it's that that's through the end of the calendar year, the three quarters of a million, and, and into the next fiscal year there would be if we don't have a change we would have lost what about a 1.5 yeah. uh, estimated yes. stream that we would have normally had annually yeah so annually it's about 1.5 correct correct and so timing of revenues is where I think Doug's saying it'd be closer to a million that we would lose for January 1 through June 30 yeah that's right okay so one and, and thank I, you but I think yeah you know perhaps just to um to continue a little bit that conversation, that um, law is up for renewal July 31st, uh, remind me, mm -hmm. um, which because of timing, um, it's, it's the simulcasting is fine for the rest of the calendar year, but the law has been on this July 31st um, yearly renewal uh, that, I'm, that we're all very curious as to what's gonna happen at the legislature for this coming year. Correct. Especially because Suffolk Downs is uh, closing. Correct, uh, so in order to simulcast, you need to have rise, live race days. If they don't have live race days, without a legislative fix, the grandfathers them in. Right. How do you simulcast after, July, after January 1? After January 1. 
uh, December 31st. There's possibilities of another licensee picking up their book, which you know Doug has talked to us about uh, the ADWs, which is a big piece of the money. But you know none of that is hashed out until you figure out what's actually going to happen. Yes. Right. We shall see. Yes. Um, and then this year's budget will require a $34.8 million assessment on licensees. Um, this is one area that we did change slightly in the memo. The assessment table in the memo has changed from the one we presented on June 6th. The total number of gaming positions has decreased by 10 based on um, Encore Boss and Harbor taking a few um, slot machines off the floor, as well as um, just a miscount on the first um, number of table games that um, MGM had provided to us. <coughs> so they did give an informal comment to us. They just said, hey, you might want to check those numbers you presented because we think we gave you something different, um, which they had. Um, and then there was some shifting around of where seats were. So um, we took some positions that we had counted as slot machine or slot gaming positions and moved them to table gaming positions. This had to do with the stadium table games at Encore Boston Harbor. They don't have a random number generator in them, so they can't be slot machines, even though it has a you know, betting station that looks like a slot machine. You're betting on a live odd, a real odd of a game versus a random number generator. Mm -hmm. And then we did the same thing with three of the, two of the roulette tables um, that don't have random number generators in them, but don't have an actual dealer. It's just being dropped into the roulette wheel, but there's no random number generator, so it's actually a table game just without a dealer. Um, so that was just some okay. shifting around. I think it changed the percentages by less than one basis point for a few people. Um, so <coughs> just wanted to call to your attention that that changed on the, from the initial memo. So it's more accurate now. Yes, it's 100% accurate right now. Mm -hmm. Many iterations of those spreadsheets with Doug and the licensees. Yeah, we spent a significant amount of time with all licensees making sure that we had everything in place. Mm -hmm. um, we were back and forth for the past month, but we did get it finalized. Mm -hmm. I think Friday morning at? At 5 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So at this time, we'd welcome any questions, comments, um, and if um, additions, changes to the packet. Um, just for a clarification, uh, in the memo where it says total, um, there's a 43 million figure that breaks out as uh, 28 for gaming, 2 for racing, and 6 for uh, research and responsible gaming. Mm -hmm. I guess there's one figure to, to, uh, that's missing, and that's so there are statutory costs. Is that yes. correct? Yes, I apologize the, for that. There's a five million in statutory costs that Attorney General's ABCC. Correct. Correct. Okay. No, it's 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 above here, but I just. Um, yeah, it's the indirect, the assessment of the Attorney yes. General, and seventy-five thousand for indirect. the ABCC. Yes. It's all it's all here, but I just. And, and it's and it's included in. That it's included in the bucket. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's further detail later. Again, I've been um, beneficiary of your extensive. Uh, briefing and I thank you for that. I don't know if anyone else has any further questions, comments. Nope. No, I think it's uh, it's great job that we that our staff does. Comments that I've had before, I, I still apply relative to uh, we're reaching a point of tapering off at least you know in theory with this uh, uh, the opening of Anchor. And as we move forward, we, we need to look for, uh, to continue what we've been doing in the past, which is looking for efficiencies uh, wherever we can. Uh, we will always look at the necessary costs and we'll assess them accordingly, uh, but we'll continue um, that diligence that we've done in the past. Okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll move that uh, the commission approve uh, the Commission's fiscal year 2020 budget as presented by staff here and discussed uh, here today and further described in the Commission's packet. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, commissioners, uh, the budget process reminded me of something I did forget. Uh, in regard to the opening of Encore Boston Harbor, I would like to acknowledge some of the partners we had in this, including ABCC, oh, yes. uh, the Lottery, and Department of Revenue. All folks, all agencies that have an interest that worked incredibly well with us, and I should have recognized up front. Um, one other person that I failed to recognize um, is Janice, who I'm sorry, the room is not quite as full as it probably should have been for me giving kudos, but um, incredibly helpful, not only during the test weeks, but also on Sunday, making mm -hmm. sure we all got there in the way we were supposed to get there. So I, I, I appreciate it. I think everybody else up here does as well. Yeah, I concur. Thank you. Moving on to item number seven in the racing division and Dr. Alex Lightbrown. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Our first item on the agenda is the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association request to race uh, Finger Lakes. Um, as you recall, they came uh, in earlier this year to uh, request the races at the beginning of the year, and now um, they're looking for the ones through the rest of the year. And um, there's a chart attached in the packet with the different races they're um, looking to race. Um, today I have Donna Pereira, who's the chairwoman of the uh, group, and then Arlene Brown, who's the secretary, if you have any questions. Welcome. Actually, a concern more than a question. Um, as you note in one of your letters to us, we have received um, complaints about uh, the races, the conditions in particular with the races. And um, I was interested to read that, of course, you have hired a racing secretary, Mr. Morrissey, who, um, in order to bring um, uh, bring a sense that things are being done equitably because that's really important to us as you know when we um, we were uh, we were mandated um, to take on the responsibilities for racing which we took on gladly frankly and um, it's an important part of what we do we we value this but we also want to make sure it's done properly and um, in reading some of the concerns and actually, we conducted an investigation because we really did have concerns about, um, uh, about certain folks being excluded. And um, I guess it's important to me, I look at this schedule, and um, I just want to have assurances from you that, in fact, you will hold to this, and there will not be last-minute changes that were not done by the racing secretary before I'm willing to approve uh, more races in the Finger Lakes. So you, sh you gave us the schedule here, and um, I'd just like to hear from you that you will adhere to this, and there won't be last-minute changes that give the appearance of excluding certain certain horses. Good Could morning. Respond to that. Um, hey, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think it's still morning. Um, it, yes, it, it is. is. It, I've been around a little longer than um, Donna has. I've been around a little bit longer than Donna has, and I can assure you that we have never made the, the changes in the schedules. And we went specifically to John Morrissey, who was a longtime racing secretary, retired now, but a longtime racing secretary, really knows his job. And he went through a, you know, a big effort to download all past performances on uh, the horses that are racing and to try to come up with an equitable schedule. Um, the problem is, that we do not have the final control up at Finger Lakes. We do not make any changes in what, or we will not make any changes in what Mr. Morrissey has presented. That's what we will give to Finger Lakes. Once it gets up there, they will not run a race that presents a negative betting pool. By that, we mean a horse that is so overwhelmingly the favorite that everybody bets on them. They have to return not only the money bet, but a 10% that's a negative betting pool. They don't, they won't write races where they're guaranteed to lose money. So we don't have control over that. Um, and like I said, we, we went specifically to Mr. Morrissey so that we could not be accused of writing races that uh, eliminate certain people. On the other hand, we do have a, 
you know, we do have some absolutely superior horses, a couple of really superior horses in the mass breeding system. If you allow them to run in every single race, they win every single race. Well, but conditions are written so that that doesn't happen. And I'm very well aware of how That's the conditions right. are so written so that will not happen. But I, I guess what I'm concerned about is if the Finger Lakes comes to you and it's a legitimate concern and a race has changed at that level, um, that, is, uh, that is understandable. But I'm talking about after your racing secretary writes the race and then the board chooses to change something, I think that is where we get into an issue um, that, that as a commission overseeing this, I'm not comfortable with. I, I can't, I can't, I can't think of a time that that has happened. Well, I think that's a, a time for, an, uh, we, we can have that discussion at a later time, but I, I just know a concern came to my attention that we took a look at, and I just would like assurances from you that you're going to hold the, um, the you're going to hold to um, the, the secretary's uh, race conditions here. And I, I think what I'm hearing is that you will. Commissioner, Absolutely. Commissioner Cameron, you've mentioned an investigation. Could you brief the public on the investigation and who conducted it and, and give us a little bit of an, an update on yeah. that, please? Sure. We, um, you know, when uh, over the years many issues come to our attention in the form of a written complaint or something and we, when we feel it's appropriate to take a look. So Dr. Lightbaum assigned um, one of our uh, racing officials to take a look at one particular matter. Um, and um, it, it just, there was, there was, uh, the racing secretary did not make the change. That was uh, substantiated in the investigation and so, which is why I'm bringing this to your attention now and that, um, and that that will not happen in the future. And so who did make the change? Uh, it, it was uh, the board that made the change. I wish I knew what race it was because... Okay, well, again, we can... I don't think I've missed I, the board meeting. Well, Dr. Lightbaum, do you want to shed some light on this? Uh, well, Susan Walsh looked into it, talked to John Morrissey. John said that he had um, put a race up that would have included everybody. And I, I think you know which horse. There was one horse that yes. did not uh, get to race. And um, that owner uh, was concerned about it. Didn't Nobody would tell him where that came from. Um, so we started an investigation, and in the meantime, um, he said he spoke to the board, and the board said that they were the ones who um, changed that or didn't offer the race that he would have been um, eligible for. Okay. Did they also explain that the racing secretary put up an additional race specifically for that horse, but opened it up to some of the New York horses, which would have made it a little more competitive and a little more of a betting, and he wouldn't go in it? Uh, he did not mention that. Would that have still qualified for mass bed purse yes. money? Yeah. Well, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, and I more. guess another concern while we're here is it, it certainly I understand spreading the money out, and I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's also important, and I know you can't guarantee who's going to win a race, but it's also important that um, the better horses are still going to earn more money than the other horses because you don't want to spread the money out so much that. Um, the average horses end up making the same amount of money as the better horses at the end of the year because that's not the incentive. The incentive of, the, of racing is still to win races and, yeah. and breed better horses. Yeah, and, and this better horse has already taken 160000 out of the two first yes. weekends yep. in Suffolk. Just, right. just, and it was just, just so we're clear about this, we as a commission, uh, we're, we're it's the, the issue of equity, fairness, and that we're doing things the proper way. That's really important. And so when you hire a racing secretary to, um, for, the, for that issue alone, which I commend you for, you hired a racing secretary to take on that responsibility of conditions, setting the race conditions, and publishing them so everyone knows it's, it's published, everyone knows what races they qualify for, they feel like they have um, a role. Um, but to change that at the last minute, uh, at the board to do that, I, I have a real issue with. So I'm just letting you know, I'm putting you on notice that in order for me to approve these races moving forward, I think the racing secretary has to be allowed to um, take on that responsibility and that you have to um, back that person and, and, and then everyone has a sense that these 
races are on the up and up and it, it'll be done fairly. It really isn't about how much money changing something later because the person won too much money. I don't think that's the reason to change a condition for a race. So I, just, I just want to clarify that right now we don't have anything in front of us regarding any of, about the investigation, correct? Correct. <clears throat> I, I have a perhaps larger concern, and that is um, other constraints that, that get into this um, framework, really. <clears throat> Uh, uh, Mrs. Brown, you mentioned uh, uh, you know what seems very reasonable. Nobody will ride a race where there will be, uh, you know, the track will not go with a race that's going to make them lose money. It makes no no sense. Um, I think uh, uh, there's 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 a larger question here in my mind, and that is a supply side that does not appear to be growing for obvious reasons. Um, I don't I don't know that the breeding pro I mean. If we really want to step all the way back uh, here, um, what was initially intended of the breeding money was to create more of a breeding program, assuming that there was going to be this virtuous uh, effect with all these other levers, including uh, money uh, going to the track for purses and the, from the racehorse development fund, et cetera. So there's, there's this um, big constraint that we are operating under uh, to begin with, because there is no track with supplemented forces for the thoroughbreds um, necessarily. Uh, I mean, with some, again, you, you do have and will have some races, as I understand, in this coming weekend in Suffolk Downs, but there's this supply side constraint that I think explains, at least partially, uh, some of what we're dealing with. If you have, and I, and I read some of the other uh, um, correspondence that we've gotten, if you are riding, uh, uh, find yourselves uh, riding a race where there's only two or three horses participating, it just doesn't seem that it accomplishes what uh, what was initially uh, envisioned by by this legislation, uh, which was to attract some of the betting public as well. Uh, so I, I I'm not putting that at fault in anybody at anybody here. I think that speaks more to the purpose of. Uh, and and, the, and the, the, whether we should be considering in the future um, this, this, this fundamental question of funding races in a, def, in a separate track elsewhere, in, in Finger Lakes or the like, um, and how much of a benefit, cost benefit there is in terms of using money to get some of the outcomes that we're getting, or frankly, reserving it for the legislature to do what they might do. But this money is is uh, the breeders' money, and the only way they can utilize that money is through racing. So it would not be money that would otherwise go. It is it is allocated to the breeders. Yeah, no, I, I, I know, and that's the only way they currently have. But I suppose I, I'm saying there's this uh, structural constraint. That was not what was initially envisioned. From the from the supplementing forces, uh, supplementing uh, purses of the racehorse development. Well, agreed. I don't think anyone anticipated um, not having the ability to race because they do not have um, a racetrack that is currently running uh, a full race meet. Right. So I don't. I agree with you that that was not contemplated, and I think we have been trying to um, sustain by allowing these folks to to run at the Finger Lakes, and they have been a a host track willing to take uh, Massachusetts uh, horses, which is, I think, a, a benefit. Um, so it is a way for them to do it. My concern is just that it's done equitably mm -hmm. and that we are, um, we are regulating in a way that we think is appropriate. I, I would just add to that, uh, you know, I know the Finger Lakes has kind of been, you know, our, our backup and an opportunity for uh, the mass breeders to be able to run. Um, I don't know what the long range prospects are for the for the Finger Lakes track. I mean, Not you hear various stories about, you know, their kind of long range um, opportunity. But, you know, I think it might be worth having the conversation to begin to look out a few years if the Finger Lakes or another track somewhere in the Atlantic. You know, seaboard area is willing to host mass races that 
we could begin to plan a little more prospectively so breeders could start, you know, you know getting yeah, ready to host a two-year-old horse at some point knowing that a specific race is planned for two years from now and that there is purse money available for it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate, longer-range strategy, but, uh, you know, to your point about, you know, the supply is drying up if the future yeah, is The uncertainty haze. certainly has affected the program. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. So you, just on that note, uh, are there any new mass bred being uh, bred? I bred two horses this year. That's, I appreciate that. That's, <laughs> that's anecdotal, uh, uh, if you will, and, but, but, but important. Um, is this, is this, I'm, I'm, more, I'm asking a, more, a broader question. We've now funded uh, these uh, for three, three or four years, uh, um, a couple of, yeah, three or four at least elsewhere. Uh, for, where, where you've been racing elsewhere in Finger Lakes. Has that yielded? And maybe this is you know, a good analysis that we could look into retrospectively. Um, you know, important increase to the mass breeding, or is it essentially just preserving the livelihood, which is not inconsequential, I should add, of those that are still doing some, any kind of marginal breeding. Um, and that's my point about, you know, whether any of that uh, concern that you uh, say, Commissioner, going forward, um, that's a big question in my mind. Yes, it is. Like I said, the uncertainty has people kind of on hold, wanting to see where things are going to go, because it's not a, um, an inexpensive um, commitment. Uh, we calculate that it costs you $30,000 to breed the mare, and wait the year, get the foal, have it, feed it for two years, break it, train it, and get it two races. 30000 is a conservative estimate. So, yeah, people are a little, you know, anxious about where this is going. And, uh, um, you know, we see cutbacks, we see, uh, you know, the uncertainty of a racetrack, although, you know, I understand that there are a few um, people looking into building a racetrack now. We just trying to hang in there until there's some kind of a commitment to that. I agree. We're hopeful that a, one of these plans is successful and they're able to, to build a racetrack and we thoroughbred uh, racing is, all, is, is allowed to flourish in the Commonwealth. Yeah, that's what, you know, everybody's kind of on edge. Mm -hmm. on, on their website they have listed the ones that have registered with them and obviously there may have been a few more that were born those years that didn't um, get to the point of being registered for whatever reasons. But, um, you know, it, there, it really has gone down. In, uh, and my numbers may be a little off because I was just going quickly down and counting. But um, in 2014, there were 22. In 15, it dropped to 9. In 16, it was 10. Um, in 2017, it was 14. And then for 18, there were seven listed on their website. Total so or the, new ones? The numbers really have gone down. And that's the to a total number? That's not a new one every year? It's not an incremental number, is it? Right, no. No, no that's how many were yeah. um, registered that year. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, that's my point about the structural. And they have to be here. registered by the time, um, yeah. yeah, they're um, ruling. So, you know, that's an accurate figure. My numbers that show that from year. 10 years ago, we bred 54 horses. Before that, we were in the hundreds. Uh, we bred uh, 54 horses. Um, two years ago, we bred 20 and 23 uh, mares. Um, and last year we were down to eight, yes. That, mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, that's my point about the supply constraint here. We're likely, right. we, the, the, the longer this continues, and I, again, I'm not faulting anybody, I, I'm just making a comment on the, the, the constraints here of, of trying to do what we're doing. I, I see some of these things will continue to appear, uh, you know, races that are not, are gonna, have to be canceled because there's not, there's a negative um, um, expected We're value. The, the legislation that we have would help alleviate some of the situation. Right now, um, you have to have a mayor into the state by October 15th. They have to stay here at least 90 days and fall out. We're, we're hoping to cut that down a little bit um, from December to December 1st because many of these mayors you can buy at the sales, Kentucky, Florida, and bring them in 
and if you buy them in the sale it's after December 1st, you have to breed back to a Massachusetts stallion, and there aren't any. There's only two in the state. So we're hoping that the new legislation will help bring in mares, uh, you know, by cutting down the period of time from bringing here October 15th to December 1st, it allows them to get horses in these sales that are already in foal right. to some nice stallions. And if you can build up your mare population, then you can build up your stallion population. It can't go the other way around. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be worthwhile um, once the season's over to sit down and, and maybe try to brainstorm some ideas on what may um, help this program. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of the money is going to older horses that are racing, which again, that, that's fine. Um, those owners are, are seeing the benefits of it, but um, the program really needs to focus on getting those horses as two and three year olds. Um, and that's what's going to keep people breeding. And so, you know, maybe even something like, um, you know, not spending all their money for a given year on purses for older horses maybe banking some of that um, so that they can show their members, look, we already have this much money in reserve, so um, even if the uh, split changes a little bit, it's not going to affect us that much because we're going to have enough money to fund two-year-old and three-year-old races for the next four or five years. Um, and I think that would certainly jumpstart people to breed. Yeah, um, right. right now, if you have an older horse and you're racing it, um, you, you may be happy with just racing that horse, getting the, the money from the racing, and you may not be reinvesting it in breeding. So. Yes, yeah. you may or may not. Yeah, right. I would welcome right. that meeting. I think yeah. it would be it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be good to uh, brainstorm, as you say. By the way, um, remind me if was that um, the fact that they could now raise that they could then raise in at Finger Lakes was that a statutory change or it did was. we just? I, I think it's mentioned in the memo. Um, Mm -hmm. what that what year it was and that it, what part of the statute so what you're talking about mrs brown relative to uh the dates and uh, uh um, is that is that also require a statutory change the dates yes, that, a, that a mayor right night needs to be the, here the law says the chapter 128 law says the mayor has right, to be so here october 15th so we're making part of our, um the new bill to change it to december 1st uh there are other things in that bill and it just slipped my mind what I wanted to say. I'm sorry. Well, you, you can come back to oh, it. Oh, I know. Uh, I'm sorry. I know. We also, in the new bill, making provisions that we can make other kinds of awards to, in, uh, to create incentives for people to drop mares in Massachusetts, uh, drop bulls in Massachusetts by putting um, a specific, an additional bonus in some places, if you drop the mayor in Massachusetts, you know, you will get a, a small bonus. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait till the horses of racing age. Uh, you know, we have a number of ideas like that oh, to yeah. try to incentivize. Uh, incentive. By the way, um, where do we stand with 128C? Which one is the, the, the live race, A or C? We, whichever, 128D, the, so, the, what we propose to the legislature for this. Um, our bill is HB 13. Yeah. And it's the same bill that we have filed with the legislature for a couple of years now. It is up for a hearing on Monday at 1 o'clock in front of the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure. There was earlier this year language in the Fiscal 19 SUP to just extend 128A and 128C. That language has been removed from the SUP, so that's no longer on the table. So there is HB 13, which is our bill. There is the Senator Boncor bill, which is much like our bill, but allows for simulcasting without live racing on the thoroughbred side, potentially for a certain period of time. And there is a third bill that, quite frankly, I don't understand how it works legally, because it seems to be an amendment to 128A and 128C, but doesn't seem to provide for the fact that they are going to expire on July 31st. Mm -hmm. So all three of those bills will be heard uh, Monday at 1. To the one that we submitted, 128D, and have yes. been submitting, um, does it provide for the type of flexibility um, that, you know, uh, we're, we've been talking about relative to dates, um, you know, so, no, dropping falls or anything like that? That's not part of our statute at all. It, what they are discussing is part of Chapter 128. 
and that's the Agriculture uh -huh. Act, and they do have a bill in front of the legislature separate. to change some of the agriculture bill timelines, but that's separate and apart from the racing oh, okay. statutes. Thank you for that clarification. Well, good luck on that. Mm -hmm. I, you have, I have a clear, uh, did you have no, a question or a comment? Uh, I actually have a, a, a question or comment. So <clears throat> I don't have, and none of my commission, fellow commissioners have any information on an investigation that apparently was conducted on the complaints that we did in, that were included in our um, uh, documents. I thought we were actually going to be addressing those, but apparently there has been from my fellow commissioner who's told us this, that an investigation of sorts was conducted. Um, <clears throat> with that said, I want to clarify, Dr. Um, Lightbound, that you are comfortable still with the recommendation at the end of your memo that the commission approve the request of the Massachusetts uh, Thoroughbred Breeders Association that's before us, based on, on the memo before us. Yes. Is that true? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would ask, and unless there's an objection, that at our next meeting, if you could provide a briefing on not necessarily this investigation per se, but on on what triggers an investigation, what threshold uh, where you decide to do an investigation, and then the procedures and the processes to ensure that both sides of, and all sides of the, you know are heard clearly, and then what we will do going forward so that um, we are aware if, if something is you know and before us that there has been an investigation because. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I wasn't informed of that. I want to make sure that all sides were heard. So it would really be a briefing on process as opposed to this, sure. this you know, we don't, I don't, it sounds as though we don't have to look backwards, um, but it would be just really helpful for me to understand that process and perhaps, I, I don't know if others are from more familiar, but I, I would like it could be a brief update. On, sure. Okay, excellent, thank you. And, and I too um, will be at, um, on there on Saturday, I look forward to seeing you uh, brief. I'll be there briefly and look forward to the race. So thank you, and we'll coordinate. And thank you for, for coming. So now. Uh, so Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the request by the Massachusetts Thoroughbred Breeders Association to race at the Finger Lakes racetrack as described in the commission packet with the assurance um, that these race conditions will not be altered uh, by the board. Second. I'm not really sure what you mean about the, the condition that you just attached. Uh, if you could just clarify. Um, the board has hired a racing secretary to write the conditions of the races. They are published. They are here in our packet, what those races will mm -hmm. be. And um, I am requesting that, uh, that uh, those uh, what the racing secretary did, his work will be honored and uh, they will not be altered. At but they point. are as described in the commission packet, correct? They, they are. Thank They're you. Here. Yeah, thank you. Helpful. Um, just a point, obviously, in the letter, it does talk about the authority that the Finger Lakes racing director yes. may change a race, but you're suggesting that there can be no changes to the schedule by, by, the, board. Board. by, our, by the board. By our, yes. But that does not be restrict the racing secretary at Finger Lakes, if he wants That's to. Right. Just, okay. Yep. Correct. Is there a second? I did second oh, the motion. I'm so sorry. Yep. Nope. Um, I'll affirm any second. further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Lightbound, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we are at the final item of commission. Commissioner's updates. Oh, no, we have one more. Oh, oh my no. apologies. I'm so sorry. I should have looked up. I know we have one more vote. One more matter um, from Dr. Lightbound. Thank you. On Suffolk Racing um, in the official edition. Thank you. So our, our uh, next item is the um, request by Suffolk Downs uh, to use um, Dr. Robert McKinney as one of their veterinarians. For the weekend, um, today I have Jessica Paquette, the Vice President of Marketing for um, Suffolk with us. Um, Dr. McKinney has been a longtime New England veterinarian, worked at Suffolk for years, and um, more recently was their track veterinarian. 
Um, when the um, meets became shorter, he went down to Florida and worked down there for a few years. And now um, the, one of the other veterinarians needed the weekend off, so he's going to come in. And everybody's very excited to have him. Very excited. Well, certainly a leg legitimate request from a very well-qualified person. It's straightforward to me. Do we have a, a motion or further questions for Dr. Lightbound? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move the commission approve the request by Suffolk Downs to add an additional racing official, Dr. Robert McKinney. Uh, uh, it's more fully described in the commission packet in front of us. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, Catherine. And um, I wanted to thank uh, Executive Director Bedrosian for mentioning this is the last weekend of Suffolk after 84 years. Um, some of the highlights I remember is when two time horse of the year cigar came. Mm. He got a state police escort from the New York border all the way to <laughs> Suffolk down. Um, when he went up for the race, not only were the patrons and betters all excited about him being there, but even the hardcore New England horsemen who had seen everything um, lined up along the whole apron on the way up to the uh, saddling paddock and everybody clapped as he went up so it was wonderful. Um, we also had another two-time horse of the year skip away that raced there. I like there. skip away more than cigar. I'll admit, I'll admit it. <laughs> um, Kentucky Derby winner that raced in the mouse cap. Real um, quiet. It, that was just Any things lots? that have happened since I was there. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the history before that was also um, outstanding. Seabiscuit, Whirl Away, Whirl Away won the Triple Crown. Seabiscuit, right. they made a movie about him and he was discovered at Suffolk Downs. So uh -huh. kind of all roads to horse racing history have led through Suffolk. That's great. I'm, I'm, look, I'm hoping to be out there on Sunday. Um, and as a big baseball fan, I know there's a baseball connection with Suffolk Downs and that infamous Hall of Fame general manager, Bill Beck, I think at one point managed Yes, and he did. Wrote Have a you read book. 30 Tons a Day? <laughs> I'm sorry? Have you read his book, 30 Tons a 30 Day? 30 Tons a Day. I have. <laughs> wow. I'm impressed. They also were um, one of the early adopters of the NTR right. safety accreditation program, um, and they also were the first uh, track in the country to institute an anti slaughter policy on all their horses. Mm -hmm. And both Chip and I are both proud owners of retired racehorses ourselves, so we have right. kind of continued to Terrific. support retired horses. And um, I wanted to thank our um, Suffolk staff in particular. Um, all of our Plain Ridge staff also comes up to help out, but um, longtime um, employees, uh, Susan Wallace, our chief judge, uh, steward, uh, Dave Ernst, our other steward, and then George Carifio, who does our licensing, um, longtime um, participants in um, uh, overseeing racing at Suffolk Downs. Mm -hmm. You've done right. a great job. And I hope you're going to preserve all those fabulous photos that are out there. Oh, they, they, um, many of them are. I have kind of some bins of the old, um, we used to keep newspaper clippings and all sorts yeah, of right. old uh, media photos. So I have all of those. Great. Uh, many of the kind of fancy artifacts are owned by HYM now. Mm -hmm. um, they, when they bought the property, but there is a historian dedicated to keeping this all alive. Oh, so don't worry. I'm great. I had, there's a book somewhere in this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. <coughs> now we can move to our final item on the agenda, commissioner's updates. Do we have any? Uh, I, I just have one uh, quick update, um, actually two. I joined with my colleagues in, in congratulating Encore on a great opening. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to go around and talk with a number of the employees and to uh, hear firsthand from them while they why they had made a career change or left where they had working uh, had been working to uh, move over to Encore, um, and uh, there was just a general excitement about the opportunities that uh, they thought were in front of them. So uh, uh, I did a couple selfies with some of the employees. That was kind of fun. And uh, a shout out to Elaine for all of her good work helping with the communication on the overall uh, travel logistics that uh, that patrons would heed. Um, my second item is uh, this week, I believe, um, Kevin Kennedy, who's the longtime uh, chief development officer for the city of Springfield, is retiring. Uh, I've known Kevin for many years. Uh, he was, for a long time, the right hand of, uh, of Congressman Richard Neal, and then he stepped into the chief development officer's role. and. 
uh, has overseen a number of incredible projects that is transforming the city of Springfield, whether it be the remodeling of Union Station, uh, the CRCC uh, rail car company building, and obviously uh, we have partnered with him along the way with the, uh, with the development of uh, MGM Springfield. So uh, I'm offering a, a certificate of appreciation to Kevin as he moves on to retirement and probably watching a lot of basketball. Uh, but uh, Madam Chair, I'd hand the certificate over to you if you want to add your signature to it. I'd be happy to, and, and I have not had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Kennedy, but I certainly had heard you speak about him and, and John Ziemba speak about him at length and the contributions he's made not only to the Commonwealth, but to, of course, uh, very much Springfield. Um, but overall, uh, his contributions have been noted enough that when I heard that he was retiring, I, I recognized I missed a, an opportunity. So um, I wish him well, and I will gladly sign this. Uh, um, it will be, a, I suspect, a, um, one of many treasures he receives uh, in, for his, in, in recognition of his service. <clears throat> Tremendous advocate for Springfield, the city, the passion, and, and this project in, in particular. We've had many, many dealings with them over the years with this project. Mm -hmm. and he, uh, I'm sure they'll miss him in the city with his, his advocacy for uh, the city and uh, his passion for all of these projects. Well, I'm sure if Mike Mathis was still here, he'd say he was a pretty tough negotiator as well. But uh, um, Kevin's been great to work with, and uh, I had a chance to work with him briefly uh, as when our paths crossed at City Hall, and uh, uh, he again, he's done a, a, an enormous amount of work on behalf of the city. Do we know who's replacing him yet? Uh, we do. Uh, the city has uh, recruited and hired a, a gentleman by the name of Tim Sheehan, who's a longtime Springfield city resident who not only has worked in Springfield city government, but he spent some time uh, at the former office of executive office, I think, of housing and community development, one of the iterations of it years ago. Uh, but for the past several years has been leading the uh, revitalization of uh, Naugatuck, Connecticut. So he's mm -hmm. essentially moving home to take over that position. Good. Well, on behalf of the commission, um, we recognize uh, his service and wish him well. So thank you. Do we have a, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Any further business? I, I should have offered another opportunity for any other commissioners. Updates? All right. Um, thank you. Um, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you.